This podcast proudly brought to you by Moss Shot Shells. Old school is back in season. Experience superior shells when you go with Boss Shot Shells. Their premium, non-toxic bismuth shells knock birds down so hard that the old guys might just think they're shooting lead again. Make sure you check out Boss Shot Shells for your next purchase of shotgun shells. Hey guys, I'm Jordan Fromer. I believe in hunting hard, hunting smart, and having a fun time while doing it. And shooting limits? Well, that's just the icing on the cake. I revel in the journey just as much as the successes it brings. From ducks to dogs to decoys and guns, we'll be talking tactics, strategies, and what it takes to get the job done. Load up and take aim. This is the Duck Gun Podcast. What's going on, folks? Me and Elliot here for another podcast. How you doing, Elliot? I'm doing pretty good. Just got back from Sand Hills in Nebraska, and that was certainly an adventure. Were you following the um, Instagram stories? Yeah, yes, I did. <laughs> I did a bunch of them. I know. I was. Uh, I was uh, very proud of you. <laughs> it's a, a big step for Elliot. <laughs> well, uh, the, one of the reasons why I may have done that is I was listening. I was working out there, and I was listening to one of our old podcasts in which you were encouraging me to use um, <laughs> Instagram stories. And <laughs> so embarrassing on the podcast. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it. And you're like, well, let's do it now. And I'm like, okay. And I start Instagram live. <laughs> Just like, no, that's not what he was talking about. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's with four guys are in, five guys are in. It's like, no, we just had this long conversation about Instagram <laughs> stories. And I said I was going to do it. And to show you, I started Instagram live. <laughs> do you remember that? That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. You never yeah, called I me I definitely out remember of. you not knowing how to do it <laughs> from the get-go. <laughs> so, man, I was posting tons of stories on this deal and it was quite the adventure i'll say that. yeah it was good did you see the flooded tent part of it yeah oh that, man uh, sleeping bags and everything get wet everything oh man it was terrible thanks thankfully um matt from high praise sportsman sportsman was there to kind of help us out we were taking an afternoon nap we had had a decent fishing morning um well actually Historically, for the Sandhills, we're catching pike and bass, but um, we caught so we caught a few fish. Um, not as good as what I would like, but we definitely caught enough to eat and everything. And um, it was a great time. And cleaned them and had lunch and everything. It was supposed to rain. So like, well, we're just going to our tent, have a little nap and everything, which is what we normally do. We fish um, from sunrise till about eleven thirty. Come back, have lunch, take about a two-hour nap, and then if we want to go out fishing again, we do. If not, we just kind of hang around the campsite and. And whatever, but this storm rolled in, and we were in this tent that Aiden gave me, and it was huge, massive, massive tent. And um, I've got to go away from the massive tents because this is like the second or third one I've had now, and they do not hold up well in the, in the wind. <laughs> so this huge storm rolls in, and the wind is blowing like crazy. I wake up, and half of the tent is like falling in, and rain's coming just straight down from the ceiling. And this tent is sectioned off into two rooms, so we pulled all our stuff in the other room, which was still dry. And literally by the time it was all said and done, there was like two inches of water in one side of the tent, and it was getting pretty wet in the other side too. And Man. we had to get out and dig a trench to kind of drain the water out, and <laughs> it it was a disaster. We had to go into a town, the closest town is Valentine, Nebraska, and went to a laundry mat, and so it was quite the adventure, but it, it was fun. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I saw some of those fish you caught, too. So those are some uh, nice pike, right? Yeah, great, great pike. Um, I say the biggest one was 34 inches. We caught three or four pike over 30 inches, um, which I'm not – I'm guessing those are somewhere around six to seven half pound pike, um, which is about the biggest that we've we've caught out there is about seven, seven and a half. And those, those are big pike, and you catch them yeah, on a regular – Yeah, those are big fish. Yeah, and um, so we didn't catch a ton of fish. In fact, I only caught two in both days and Nevin, my son and I both didn't do very well. We caught two each, um, but we had plenty of bites. I um, mean, we're just kind of having issues landing them. Um, but everyone else caught about five to seven to eight on the trip. But so we weren't catching a bunch in the two days, but the fish we were catching, I think there was two or three bass caught over four pounds, um, three or four pike over 30 inches. So the fish we were catching were really, really good fish. Wow. So, yeah. That sounds great. It's just so beautiful out there. I don't know if the, um, photos and the videos that are putting out there showed it, but it's the most, it's just such a peaceful, 
relaxing. It's like the population out there. It's just not, not hardly anyone that lives out there because the sand hills are immense and you can't really farm them. You, and most of them are like national parks. It's just so the population density is really, really small. In fact, I've got big duck hunting plans in my mind for the future out there. Uh, but in, and there's ducks up there, which we don't have ducks in Kansas right now. There's mallards and teal out of a little pothole. And it's just a gorgeous, peaceful, relaxing place. It's just wonderful, wonderful environment. Awesome. Sounds like a great way to spend an off season weekend for sure. Yeah. And we were wearing hoodies, you know, like in Kansas right now, we're not wearing hoodies and that's a 10 hour drive. You get up there and I'm sure that's not true. It was a little cooler at the time, but you know, 55 at night and you get up and you're fishing and it's low sixties and you're wearing, you can wear a hoodie and you know, mid to late June, you're wearing a hoodie. That's special. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh that's the way I like it too. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a great, great trip. Really, really fun. When we I think we're going to go back up there next year as well. Um, we've been up there in my lifetime. We've probably been up there 10 to 15 times total combination of fishing and grouse and, and uh, prairie chicken hunting. And, and, uh, but I think the next time I go at some point, I'm going to go up there and really hit the duck hunting up there. Cause lots of potholes and, and, um, I think, I think you could do well, um, waterfowl hunting up there. And, and yeah. like I said, the population density is so small and it's so beautiful. I mean, you've seen some of, um, uh, Matt's, videos high prairie sportsman and he's not that far up but his videos in the sand hills it's just so pretty I, i'm i'm gonna duck on it it's gonna happen yeah awesome yeah, i think i think uh yeah like you said watching his videos that's definitely someplace in the future i'd like to hit up as well it's just uh not very many people so there's not as much fight for the the locations and he seems to do pretty well early season out there yeah. as well yeah he does and the lake actually that we were staying on you can only hunt some of the lakes up there and some you can't but the lake we we're actually camping on, you can duck hunt, and it's a big lake. I mean, you could just hang out there and and try to duck hunt that lake. And there's some smaller lakes around, and it's it's the Prairie Pothole region, so there's all sorts of little tiny ditches and and holes. Um, really, and stuff so it's done. it's same as like the Dakotas Prairie mm -hmm. Pothole type stuff. Uh, I haven't been up there, but it is part of the Prairie Pothole a, a region for sure. You okay. you're driving and you see all sorts of just little tiny potholes of water and oh there's a couple teal and and oh, there's mallards and and uh so i don't know, I don't know why my dog's barking but man <laughs> smack her she had you another seizure your, while i was gone as dog. well oh wow well. so that's her third one now be quiet that's her third one now in the last month so mm. i don't know i don't know what to think about that yeah that's no fun no not at all don't know really what to do about that yeah. So did I you have pigeon hunting again? I thought I saw you out. I, I saw your Instagram story, but I didn't. I don't know what I was doing, but I didn't hear it. I just saw it. It looked like you were out pigeon hunting again. Yeah, I went out and and well, I say pigeon hunting. So there's uh this farm I go to. If you pigeon hunt, like it's not really even hunting. You're just shooting pigeons. So let's mm -hmm. just call it pigeon shooting. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you just go out and sit somewhere. And well, anyways, this place I, I was at the birds all want to go up into the silo. So it's like trying to shoot decoying ducks that are decoying two stories above you. So hmm. <laughs> maybe you uh, sit up in the silo. <laughs> uh, yeah. Something like that. I'm, I'm just saying it's not worth doing it that way. I was trying it that way. I shot one. Um, but yeah, it's better if you can get them somewhere where they're not trying to fly into a silo. <laughs> yeah. How'd chief do? Uh, he did pretty good. I mean, it's just one. And w then we worked with that one, did some drills, but uh, we're on to doing some blinds right now. Um, in the last couple of days, we've been doing 85 yard blinds. Nice. So that's a, that's a pretty good distance for him. Um, that's pretty much the whole length of my yard from the road all the way to the back of my property. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So can't go any further than that, but that's kind of where we're at. Still trucking along. He's doing good. I wouldn't say he's, uh, he's definitely improving. Yeah. Getting way better. So awesome. we need to stick with it all the way through season. So um, you think we're about ready to bring Phil on here? Yeah. Yeah. You want to do kind of like a mini introduction before we roll right into the podcast? Yeah. And I hope that I'm pronouncing the last name right. It's Phil Conkey. And he is um, a waterfowl photographer, avid hunter photographer. And if you if you don't follow him on, on Instagram, you certainly should. Phil Conkey, K-A-H-N-K-E. 
And um, man, he his photos are awesome. He gets right close up on waterfowl. He's got not just waterfowl photography; he does landscapes and stuff. But he's an amazing photographer, avid waterfowl hunter, and he also is the communication content and communication manager for Bandred, which is attached with Avery and GHG. And I and we'll talk to him more about that because I'm not exactly sure where I know the Bandred, Avery, and GHG are essentially owned by the same ownership group, I believe. Um, I think that's how it works. So he works with them, and we're actually excited to announce today that they are the newest partner on the Duck Gun Podcast and also my YouTube channel, Freelance Duck Hunting. So Jordan and I are both really excited about that. Um, We're going to have a partnership with them, so we're going to be running some um, spots um, for them and just really excited to talk. I don't know about you, but um, I, I obviously I'd known of Banded and Avery and JG. I didn't know they were all one, and I didn't realize the quality of um, the Banded gear once I got into the catalog and and really started looking. I was like, oh my gosh, this is really high quality stuff, which I had never even bought anything from Banded. Did did you have a little better understanding of their equipment than I did? Um, yeah, and, and I'm definitely, uh, you know, newer to waterfowl scene than you are, but I've, you know, seen their stuff. It's, it's everywhere. Um, everybody loves it. And so it's just, uh, I would say one of the biggest names in waterfowl. So it's awesome to, um, be partnered with those guys for sure. Yeah. Well, I knew they were a huge name and I thought really highly of them and I thought really high of Avery and we had had some, uh, greenhead gear decoys that we really, really loved. Um, but, uh, so I guess I actually knew a little bit more of Avery product and GHG than I did banded. So anyway, yeah, we're really excited to have them as a partner and really excited to talk to Phil. Um, so, um, before we bring him on, don't forget, um, if you want to, um, if you want to, to jo- I have to edit this out. Sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm just totally, I'm totally lost. It's all right. I'm not right. editing any of this out. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, you're going to edit it out. I'm going to smack you in your poison ivy ridden nards. <laughs> no, so if I'm you, definitely not getting edited out. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, if you would like to communicate with Jordan and I and the rest of the Duck Gun Podcast community, you can come on over to Facebook to fellowship of the duck guns also make sure to check out jordan and i on youtube my youtube channel is freelance duck hunting and jordan's is duck Gun chronicles and instagram it's at duck Gun chronicles and at freelance duck hunting and don't forget to um on itunes leave us a review and tell us what you think of what we've got going on so um we ready to bring him on yeah and real quick i want to say um we have been seeing more reviews from you guys so really appreciate that um, just wanted to read the last one we got from Skeet Junkie, uh, and he says, best duck podcast available. Awesome info every time. Information down to earth guys that are just as passionate as I am about this lifestyle. So really appreciate that five-star review, written review. Awesome. So Good keep one. them coming, guys. Hey, is this our 100th episode? This one is number 99. Are you sure? Because if you look on on uh, iTunes, have you looked at their numbering? The last yeah, one so we put I up got says some, 99. It's some of those that uh, I had to save as drafts where we had audio dif- uh, difficulties. So the way you have to do it when you upload it, which is this, this is probably too much information for the listeners, but you just you have to save it on there and post the whole thing again, at, like a new episode. So it's not the same episode. I can't like replace the audio. So we okay. have audio issues on two episodes that I fixed in the past. So this is 99. This is number 99, yeah. Okay. 100 episodes, I was thinking, that's a lot of time. We've yeah. been dedicated. We've spent a lot of time on this, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and uh, bring them on in here. But first, a quick word from our partners. Gunner's American-made dog boxes come with a lifetime warranty and the market's only CPS crash test certification. The guys over at Gunner Kennels have conducted major stress tests to show just how strong they really are, like applying 4,000 pounds of force, dropping a 630-pound hammer from 8 feet, and shooting it with a 12-gauge shotgun at 7 paces with no bullet penetration. Engineered for your dog and built for your peace of mind. Gunner doesn't cut any corners. Nothing comes close to the G1. Go to GunnerKennels.com and use code DuckGun10 at checkout for 10% off your next purchase. 
We'd also like to give a big thanks to our partners over at ShotCam. Now I've been using ShotCam for the last year and I can tell you right now, it's a great tool for improving your shooting, whether you're doing clays or live birds or just want to see some cool footage of your shots after the fact. Make sure to check out shotcam.com and use discount code DUCKGUN at checkout for $40 off. Hi, this is Killian Bailey from Bailey's Game Calls. I'm here to tell you about our duck, goose, and wood duck calls. We use 3D printing technology to revolutionize the industry. This new technology allows us to create calls with the same sound as wood, acrylic, or anything in between that's at a fraction of the price. Make sure to check out baileysgamecalls.com for your next game call. What's going on, folks? I'm Jordan from Duck Gun Chronicle. Got my co-host, Elliot, Freelance Duck Hunting, Graybeard from Freelance Duck Hunting alongside me. And our guest tonight is Phil Conkey, and he is the content communicator, content and communications manager over at Bandit, Avery, and Greenhead Gear. And also, he is renowned for his um, skills in wildlife photography. How you doing tonight, Phil? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Doing great. You know, first thing, when we jump into this, we definitely want to hear a little bit about um, your waterfowl history and how you've got, how you got into waterfowl hunting um, as you, as you grew up. Oh man, it was, I almost don't remember a time when I didn't waterfowl hunt at some point. Um, it was, you know, of course, just like 99% of other people that got started duck hunting. I got got started duck hunting because of my dad. Um, he was pretty avid waterfowler, at least until pheasant season opened, which back in Minnesota was kind of the standard when there were pheasants there. And, uh, you know, so when I, when I was younger, like really young, we would hunt that first three weekends and I thought I was as, as dyed in the wool duck hunter as you could get back then from hunting those, you know, six <laughs> days, maybe seven if I got a day off of school. And then, you know, as, as I got a little bit older, we, um, you know, we started to expand our hunting a little bit longer in the season. And it was just always that thing. Even, and even with those, those few days of hunting each year, it was always that thing that I looked forward to. You know, partially because of how my dad built it up as a as an event. It wasn't just uh, simply going out to shoot ducks, but he liked to plan. He liked to have all these. He liked to make everything a big event. So it was this thing where we had sandwiches and we had hot chocolate, and we got decoys ready ahead of time. And we we studied uh, the wind direction and, and the spots we were going to hunt, and made everything into a really kind of an analytical um really like procedure in terms of how we we're gonna hunt and i guess i've kind of transferred some of that to my hunting now and it's what's made me i think it's probably what made me really love hunting because it wasn't just you know something that we just kind of went out and randomly did but we had a lot of other things involved in it so i think you know that's that's the the very intro and the first the first few years and from there you know, I kind of took my own direction in things, but I, mean, I would imagine almost everybody has, has had a fatherly influence at some level, and I respect those who did it on their own because it's nearly impossible to get going on your own. And have have you lived in pretty much the same general area your whole life, or have you uh, are you hunting the same grounds now you did as a child? No, no, no. Um, so I... I grew up in southern Minnesota, town of Wasika, which is kind of its own cool little little area. It's a very waterfowl hunting rich area. A bunch of well known uh, duck and goose callers have come from that town uh, and and that area as well. And not just callers, but hunters, guys that have guided, guys that have moved on to other things, but stayed within the the waterfowl world. Um, and so that was, it was just, it was kind of a prairie pothole type area. A lot of smaller to mid-sized lakes that we hunted. But it was, 
it was pretty well busy in terms of of traffic. I mean, anywhere hunting in Minnesota is a busy place. And I lived in Minnesota until I was, uh, I think, 30, about 30 years old. And I had the chance to move to South Dakota. And the minute that I did, it took me about took me about two phone calls to these to answer back yes i had to call a couple of buddies that lived in the area uh, where i live now and or that i knew they knew the area and when they told me it was good hunting i pretty much made the call back to my boss and said yep i'll take it and <laughs> got out here so that was uh that was, was that your biggest influence into into moving out there <laughs> oh without a doubt yeah, like I mean, I, I literally, like, I knew what the job kind of was going to be. I worked for Cabela's for a long time, back then, and I had, uh, I mean, that I, I had really no other influences besides that. I wanted it was a promotion, and it <laughs> was a promotion in the duck hunting world, as well, and my quality of duck hunting. So I, those two combined, it was kind of a no brainer for me. Awesome. So that area that you're that you're currently hunting, um, and you and I talked off air to kind of that probably shouldn't name the specific spots, but I certainly before we're done, I've been up there one time, and um, it was actually the first season that I was videoing, and the quality of these videos were terrible. But um, <laughs> so I, before before we get off, I I definitely want to pick your brain about how we were going about things up there. Um, but, and whether you were, whether we were on track or what mistakes we were making, there wasn't that many ducks and we scratched out a few, but we just missed the front by like a, a three or four days. Cause you know, when you have a trip, one of the worst part about taking hunting trips, when you have a nine to five job is you've got to put it on a calendar and yeah, you have you, to go when you can go. Yep. Mm -hmm. We literally missed the front by, I think might've just been two days. I mean, it hit right after we were there, but do you hunt is, are the majority of your hunts in your local area? Cause I know you travel quite a bit, but would you say the majority of your hunts are in that same spot area? Um, I, my hunts vary in terms of, uh, I'm trying to think of which it is latitude or longitude, but in the, my northerly, uh, jaunts, North South excursions depend on the time of the year. And what we have for for weather and water, but a typical season here, and the further north you go, the better it's going to be. Uh, we we tend to have less, a little bit less pressure as you go north, but also more grassland. So that that local that local hunting is better up north, like hunting local birds that were raised there. You're just going to have a better quantity of birds. Plus, there's more terrain. But then when you go, but as you start to move down the season the weather gets colder those birds will push slowly um, slowly but surely whether it's calendar induced or weather induced but those birds will start to push down and as the season gets gets on i can hunt closer to home and as the season moves on past that i'm able to hunt um, some rivers and things that will stay open quite a bit longer into december even you know, which up here, I mean, there's people ice fishing at the same time I'm duck hunting in some spots. But, you know, like, I mean, this past, this most recent season, I was able to hunt a lot of days within 20 to 30 miles of my house, which on an average season, I, I almost never hunt that close because I'm kind of in a duck, a duck desert uh, right exactly where I am. But, you know, 30 to 60 miles away from me in any direction I have, I have a better flight path so i'm kind of right in the so, middle of a lot of stuff so you kind of follow the migration and don't have any set set trips you just kind of follow follow the weather you know we don't we don't really ever make amongst me and my friends we don't ever make a real hard hard set rules we have places that we want to hunt um, places that you know we say we need to get to this lake this year or this part of this river or we need to go to this state because we, we saw the spot on our way to another duck trip, or we went there at this time this year, and it was good. We have all that stuff in the back of our minds, but like you said, we're you know when I worked retail, I had I had a little tiny bit of flexibility in terms of I could take off days of the week, like weekdays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, pretty well. And one of my best hunting buddies is a pilot. Another one uh, runs his own business, and so they were fairly flexible 
we would just kind of wait to see what the weather was doing and you know maybe we thought hey you know looks like we have some days days off that match up two weeks out from now we should go to missouri well oh shit they got you know they froze up or they got a bunch of snow or it's been super warm there it doesn't sound good okay let's go somewhere else so we we vary that stuff as much as we possibly can i mean there's days where we know we're going hunting I mean, i've got the boat hooked up ready to go but until 10 o'clock that night we don't know where our final destination is hmm. just in terms sounds of, like a you know, it, it helps a ton in uh in terms of what your your productivity of your hunts but it's a little nerve-wracking sometimes just because you know you don't you're driving somewhere thinking god are we going to get a hotel are we going to you know what's it going <laughs> to be like for pressure you don't know anything what you're getting into so it just you want to pull your hair that sounds out sometimes, like a really but it's fun sounds like a really exciting way to do it for sure yeah and so i guess um i mean that seems like a lot of knowledge to acquire too on duck hunting spots because i'm thinking about um my local area and you know i got that um figured out but it's like if you're going to figure out your hunting spots over in Missouri and um, taking trips that way and you don't know where you're going to take your trip, how long did it take you to kind of acquire all that knowledge? Or how have you done it? Um, it's ongoing. <laughs> you know, we, it's, it's never ended. I mean, I, I feel like a beginner. There's a couple of friends of mine. One in particular I can think of, uh, Wayne Salem. I mean, I feel like a beginner compared to this guy. He's, he's maybe... 10 years older than me and maybe maybe not even that and I feel like that guy knows infinitely more than me in terms of these things but you know we kind of just we, we tend to stick to that central flyway uh Miss western Mississippi flyway area and you know you hear you hear things I mean even some of the spots that we've learned about we've learned through videos and you know, old old hunt videos um you know, you see things on YouTube and you just, and you start looking at Google maps and Onyx and you're looking at for any piece of water and then you're looking for cattails and you're looking for brush and you're looking for things that could, could flood up when the water's high. And so you're, you're not only looking for public places, but you're looking at the places that have water variability and then you got to watch the weather and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it, it sounds like a lot of work, but it's fun. I mean, I I love watching all that stuff and keep an eye on it. And you know, there's probably a group of six to six to twelve guys that throughout mid November into January that I'm constantly in communication with, texting. Someone's saying, "Hey, you know this this area's got birds. I heard these guys are getting them. Hey, uh, water level is perfect here. You need to get down to this area. All that." all that kind of stuff that goes into it and you build a little network i mean you can't none of it is ever when you're when you're hunting six to 12 hours away from home you know you can't ever rely completely on on your own research you have to take some advice from people and you know and people are telling you and, and working with people and then i do the same i try to help people out if they want to come hunt around my area i'll tell them things that i know as well it's a two-way street but yeah, it's an ongoing deal. I mean, I definitely know more. I mean, the last five years, I've learned more than I did the previous five years, that's for sure, just because I've ventured further. And as you, uh, you know, especially as technology increases, you have a lot more access to information, too. So, so we and should probably Instagram mention. following has allowed me to, to reach out to people in different areas, too. So that's helped a bunch. So, so you have your own podcast as well, and it's called uh, Shooting Time, right? Correct. I do. Yes, it's in a it's on a hiatus, but it it's in uh, discussions to get going again. So, so I was listening to an episode about you guys did about um, boat blinds, and you were going through the various types of boat blinds and and giving them ratings between how much did they cost and how well did you hide and oh, yeah. and I know and kind of in your home turf where you hunt, the boat blinds are extremely important. Um, when you travel around, travel north, do you do you lay out boat hunt as well, or do you guys pretty much boat blind hunters? Um, we don't. Well, I would say for the most part, last year 
You know, it totally depends on the time of year and the situation. You know, like early in the year, our birds are not on on big water. Uh, they're a lot of times not in places that you can get a big 18-foot hard side blind into. So we're a lot of times using our like a little Karstens um, or a little 16-foot lightweight boat with a little smaller motor. Um, that type, or even walking in. So it, it all depends. I mean, we're flexible. Obviously, when once you have the comfort of hunting out of a nice blind, that's what we want to do. But yet, you know, I'd rather hunt out of my Carson's and shoot 10 greenheads with a buddy than hunt out of my big boat and shoot two blue wings. So we'll do that extra, <laughs> the extra work and the little, you know, we'll, we'll switch it up as we need to. But um, for us, like the layout hunting the deal there's not nearly the situations like where you guys have um, where you've got that low really low cover yeah um well this year would be different because i mean some of our lakes have gone up when i was fishing the other day some of our lakes have gone up five five to six feet since springtime so it'll be a different situation but you know i i've got i have a fleet of boats it feels like i've got four or five different duck boats and <laughs> each, each one to fit a different situation. So, you know, we'll take, we'll take whatever we need to, but yeah, without a doubt, if we can take the big boat, I mean, that's, that's the one coming with. Yeah. Well, um, the first time I heard your name was from the average waterfowlers and the reason they brought you up then they had a podcast. I think, you know, who those guys are, oh, yeah. um, is because I was having problems with my layout boat. So we weren't, we were using raffia grass and yep. you guys actually mentioned this problem on the podcast I listened to that the raffia, it will get matted down. It's no longer three dimensional. And um, we were struggling because with mallards, we were using these raffia blankets that we were building and, and we weren't hitting enough and, and we weren't being able to get the mallards in. And I was talking to the guys about it and they said, you need to talk to Phil about what he does to go about um brushing his layout blind i actually had your number and meant to call you and never did that's like three years ago so i'm finally getting around to the conversation give me a little one on 101 about uh, your methodology for concealment in your layout boats like what do you got how, how do you go about grassing them on my layout boats or just duck boats in general um well for me specifically layout but if there's if there's not a difference then it doesn't matter uh, but I would be more interested in the layout boat. I, th I think it, it can be similar. Um, and the, the deal is, is I think you just, so it, it obviously depends on the exact habitat that you're hunting. Um, you know, a lot of stuff that I've seen your photos, you're in super low mm -hmm. uh, smart weed. Yeah. And if I were to hunt that scenario, and we did this with my 18 foot hard side high low blind. We just took smart weed, threw it on top of my boat, covered it up, and shot ducks. You know, like you would never, I mean, it, it doesn't even make sense that it works, but it does because you just blend it enough. Um, <clears throat> while, whereas people around us were not shooting ducks because they just had their regular bolt blind there. Mm -hmm. But the. You can, you can use natural or uh, uh, like synthetic artificial um, like raffia type stuff as a base but then I, I mean that that extra 15 minutes that you spend with either a weed trimmer or pulling grass or a knife or whatever you want to use that's the thing that makes the difference when you're when you're eliminating corners when you're eliminating sharp edges and you're just looking like a piece of natural, natural structure. Even if you're a little bit higher, uh, that's that's the key. And and using shadows, because that, to me, like camouflage isn't specifically about the color that you're wearing or what you stick on your boat, but it's about how you use the wind and the sun and the things around you to hide. Um, you know, there's a lot of times that we'll use a side wind or we'll use a, a bank or we'll use a, a tall patch of fragmites. I mean, it might only be, you know, a 
a couple hundred fragmites jammed into one spot, but if you can get your boat into that shadow, <clears throat> that's better than any type of camouflage that you're going to actually set right onto the boat itself. Because then I mean, you're, you're using that sun against them. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's, so, it's so dependent upon the, the exact scenario. And it might, you might hunt the same spot day to day, but your wind direction or where you hunted the day before and the cover is all matted down. I mean, all that stuff matters so much. But, you know, I like, I like to get a little vertical, like 3D depth into any bind, whether it's, whether it's a layout boat, whether it's a, a pop-up um, 16-foot boat blind, or whether it's my, my big hard side blind. I like to have something in there to add that depth, create some shad, create some, create some ways to break up the, the form of the boat, um, hide your movement, hide any of those black holes that ducks are seeing when they're coming down in. I mean, all that kind of stuff goes hand in hand, and it's you know it's not just one specific thing, but it's it's such so critical. I mean, without a doubt, hiding I, I have to say is the the most important thing that you can do in in terms of if you're on the right spot in terms of getting ducks in close. It's the most overlooked aspect for sure yeah no doubt i mean you know the area that i hunt that we brought up earlier i'm not going to disclose <laughs> it uh it's a pretty popular place to hunt boats like mine i mean like when you go when i go there my boat isn't really anything special people see it on the internet and they think holy cow this thing is crazy but it's nice inside but like in terms of hiding if you just stuck that boat in some of the places where i see other people stick their boats they're not shooting ducks Mm -hmm. These guys will take these 18 and 20 foot boats and they spend $10,000 to have a blind belt. And then they just think they can just, just park it somewhere and just shoot ducks. And in, you know, in the perfect scenario with brand new ducks that day and the sun is right and all that good stuff. Yeah, you can get by with it. But man, when you take that extra three minutes to, to push your boat back into the cover a little bit so you're, you have some backdrop behind you. And then you go and break out a, uh, a hedge trimmer and you cut off some cover to kind of stick it on the front of the boat. I mean, the difference, and anyone who's ever done it, the difference in shooting ducks at 10 yards backpedaling versus 40 yards flaring, I mean, it's, it's not even, it's not even, it's so obvious the difference that when you're hidden well in terms of how they finish versus what your success is going to be. And you can shoot a three-man limit with, three to four flocks of ducks versus you know needing 10 flocks of ducks yeah so yeah concealment well, is is so important when i was in your area and that's the only time i've, I've been up there twice once fishing and just kind of more scouting than fishing mm -hmm. in the spring and then a couple years later we went up to hunt um i've seen a lot of boat blinds especially you know you get places in kansas like cheyenne bottoms guys love boat blinds in that area but yep. it, where you're hunting, one benefit you guys have is a lot of that. Um, I don't, I don't know what it, what kind of vegetation it is. It grows nice and tall there. It's that fragmite. Okay, and people it's in your area. Curse is what it is. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's true. The, the, the people in that area go to the extra mile for boat blinds. I, I was blown away by how impressive people. Uh, most most of the people you saw putting on with the boat blinds, I mean, it's like you can't even see the boat. It's just yeah. a bush. Uh, yep. A lot more so than around here. And around here, you know, you get out to some, you know, these prairie marshes, you don't have that big a cover, and guys will do just what you say. They'll go out there with their boat blind, and they'll just stick up a little X blind or whatever, and it's got, you know, they've got some raffia and some real grass attached to it. It doesn't look real, and you're talking about, Neat, you know, vegetation that's that comes up maybe to the bow of the boat at most. And I mean, you those guys are always shooting ducks at 35 to 40, and that's one reason we've never, um, we've always gone to the we've got an 18 foot boat, um, but we use it as a transport because in in those types of areas, we just don't see guys having the kind of success at 10 to 15 yards that we want. They're shooting ducks, but it's you know, 35 to 40. Uh, but yep. when I went in your area, the blinds there were extremely impressive. And the fragmite you're calling it obviously makes it yep. a lot easier to be able to hide those boats. And you know what? It depends too. I mean, we've had days where we've stuck that boat out in places where you would never, ever believe 
that way you can shoot ducks with just just the boat and no backdrop and no tall cover but using um using that tumbleweed that we have on it it just looks like a big clump of grass mm -hmm. and if you can if you can hide those the holes the black the black holes you know the shooting holes if you can hide that you can hide the movement and you hide the dog you can get away with it in some spots i mean it isn't always and there's times where we have ducks flare um if you know if we're not hidden well and maybe it takes a lot more ducks to cycle through to get a limit and then there's times where maybe you're hidden so well that i mean you're done way before you'd ever think you are you should be so it, it's so it's so dependent on on your habitat and what you're hunting but yeah without a doubt i mean if i were to just go hunt every day in a low you know a one foot of cover i i would i'd have i'd have a boat more like what you guys are hunting all the time or i'd have a i even made one oh a few years ago i made a small i took a 16 foot boat and those uh gator hide type boats have you seen those no uh -uh. where basically you sit on the bottom of the boat you sit horizontal across the boat on the bottom like on your butt huh. with your legs just straight out in front of you and then you you have this uh like a the metal comes up over the most of your body and then you have a little i i made a little piece where it kind of comes up over your head so you're low i mean but you know it's you're only 20 inches off the bottom of the boat but it's it's still something sitting there and it's it's still a challenge to try to hide something like that whereas you know those little layout boats that usually that little mound you know you kind of look like a little clump is what you're trying to do of course i assume and that's a lot more effective than that so it's what, what kind of carts and stuff People ask me a lot about blind so I have some YouTube videos out. I get asked a lot, and I'm like, you know, this is, I mean, some of this is a very specific thing, but but I've taken that boat all over the place and shot ducks with it almost everywhere I've gone. Um, so, it, you know, you just have, you know, and sometimes you maybe you can't hunt exactly where you want to, and, you know, it's just one of those deals. What makes duck hunting fun is you kind of got to adapt to what's going on. Well, I know we want to talk to you about your photography, but before we move on, um, I'm dying to ask you, uh, get your opinions on how we were trying to hunt your area. So we don't have the boat blind, but we've got the big boat and we've got mm -hmm. the layout boats. Now in that area, you've got big main pools and you've got little tiny pools kind of that are a little harder to get to kind of back off through the section, right? Yeah. Um, and so what we were doing is we were putting our layout boats on the 18 footer kind of going past the big pools and then when it got to be like ankle deep we were taking the layout boats off and pulling them back to a lot of the the, the smaller pools which is really strange in that area is that all the pools seem to be just right about at least when we were there about wader deep or a yep. little bit more you got like yep. ankle deep then you get to the open water and it's like wader deep and yep. really interesting environment uh, but anyway we were hunting those trying to hunt those smaller back pools where the bigger boats can't get to and my question to you is um do the ducks like those back those little back pools we didn't we shot probably on a i think we had a two or three days and we probably shot seven eight nine ducks in those three days so it wasn't very good action but yeah um do you think that's a a, a good strategy we had or are the bigger pools the way to go um so i'll give i think this can generalize a little bit without having to say exactly what we're hunting but i think i can generalize a bit and say that when you're hunting that type of a deal, um, you know, it, essentially it's a refuge situation in which you're hunting because the birds sometimes are going to sit in exact places where you can hunt. And sometimes they're just going to sit out on open water or back in a refuge area and you're just working on trafficking them. So you kind of got two, two ways to go about hunting those areas. And we and we do it that exact way. We either a try to get where we happen to kick up ducks, and a lot of times that's going to be some of those smaller pockets <clears throat> that we can get a boat into, or we're going to hunt real close to th that pocket, or maybe off of it just a little ways where we know those birds are coming, and we're going to traffic those birds, but going to that area, or you're hunting birds coming and going from their their roosting area to their feeding area 
So for us, I mean, our, our majority of scouting um, <laughs> is done in the evenings as we're, we're sitting and watching or, or while we're hunting too, I guess. So, you know, if, if it's a slow day and we're not seeing birds coming right over us and we're not killing them, we're watching what's going on. Um, but our evenings, we might, we might uh, grab a beverage and stop somewhere and watch from a vantage point and see where, where those birds are going so we kind of know where to go the next morning. And those those pockets will sometimes hold birds, but really there's almost no difference. And, and I like to hunt those small pockets simply due to the proximity that you're going to have those ducks, and you're not going to get big watered. Meaning, yeah. they're not going to they're not going to land at 75 yards out. They're going to land at 30 yards out for the farthest shot. If they if they were to land straight up against the cattails on the other side, mm -hmm. so I love hunting those small pockets. Um, but you know, if you don't have ducks in there, you're essentially just trafficking ducks, and then that's when you need the biggest spread. You want the most visibility, and it's sometimes hard, especially when you get those tall fragmites. You know, if the duck is going a half mile north of you, maybe or even a third of a mile, just in calling range, but you've got a huge bank of some tall cover on their side of you. They don't see you at all, so you're never going to get those gimmies that just come in and come over you. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go into that, but, I mean, if you were to kick out two to three to four hundred ducks out of one of those spots, I would say absolutely you're on the right path. If you were to have been hunting a quarter, a quarter mile away from that area and you watched a nonstop string of ducks go over that, that spot, um, you know, then I would say for sure you're on the right path and you just need to get underneath them because in that specific area, as I found in most places, I mean, we kind of did the same thing in Missouri this year on some public ground that we'd never been to and we were just trying to get underneath birds and you get, get them on, on top of you and you break them down with the duck call and decoys and whether it's big water or small water, just getting them underneath you or over the top of you, I mean, is getting underneath them is, is the biggest, most important thing. So when you have the right idea, I mean, for one, I mean, I love, I love those small places and I've shot a lot of ducks out of them, but to be honest in that spot, I've probably shot more ducks off of some of those bigger open spots mm -hmm. there. And, and what, and you just take with it, you know, when you get, when you get big watered and you got a, a flock of 20 mallards land at 100 yards you know you just that's how it is but you just, you're going to have more opportunities maybe than you would in the small water if they weren't already using it previously to you being there yeah it sounds like we were pretty much on the right track with a, the first morning we went in and just scouted and, and there wasn't yeah. much movement so we ended up just setting up somewhere and then that day we saw there was a few mallards kept going down a little hole. Day two, we set up in that little, I mean, when I say it was slow, I mean, <laughs> you could go a while and not see anything. It was really slow. But we found a little tiny pocket where at least some mallards seemed to be going down. And we yep. felt really fortunate to shoot three the second day. I mean, that's how slow what it was. What year was this? Do you remember? Um, 2015. I'm trying to think of what year. Mid-November, it was like uh, right around November 12th of 2015. I need to like look through my uh, photos and see what year that was. But yeah, mid-November can be tough. I mean, it's a, it it's that area and, and so many of these spots are so dependent on migration. And there's enough pressure there that, you know, if you're there five days after some new ducks get in, you know, you're going to you might have some struggles because it's there's a lot of there's a lot of people chasing them and those birds and they're not going to sit around wait for other people to shoot at them so yeah you, you can go from feast to famine and in a matter of a day really so well it was a beautiful area we enjoyed just being there just exploring and being there was worth every second so as i'm looking i'm looking at uh photos for my 2015 <clears throat> season on my phone camera roll right now <clears throat> and I'm seeing we were hunting the northern part of the state right at, during that whole stretch when you would have been I think there. that was a pretty warm year in general yeah so we were up north of there quite a ways 
and it wasn't oh geez yeah it wasn't almost until december when we hit that area so you know if that tells you i mean it was probably tough you probably there was probably a quick blast of mm -hmm. birds that moved through there and it's and it's you know a lot of these places you know that's we see that calendar migration really hard kick in like I mean, you can go some of these spots and i've shot them in oh mid-november early november you know dang you're wearing a t-shirt if you get a teeny tiny north wind even on a 50 degree day you can still see some migration come in but you, know, you got to get lucky if you're doing it after they got beat up you know it's it's a it's a challenge at best yeah but yeah so it's, you know, it's one of those deals that it's fun to learn i mean like we hunted like I, I love that kind of stuff like we went to oklahoma to hunt a couple of years ago out of the boat just based on calling a biologist and he said yeah there's a bunch of ducks here so we jumped in the truck and drove down there and a place we'd never been and you know the first day was super struggle and the next day was really good and the next day was good and, and then last day was super tough and but you know you just kind of learn and you as, as you put your time in all that kind of stuff it, it kicks in and the place you're talking about though is different it's a special place because it's so big and there's so yes. many different things you can do that, that i mean you can I get love, lost back in there <laughs> yeah you can i love talking about it like my gps uh, talking about being lost in my gps for down there is just a an absolute zoo of lines crossed and waypoints and places to avoid and places to get to and <laughs> i love that kind of stuff i mean there's nothing better than a duck marsh where you where you can just drive all over so yeah i made a bunch of uh i printed off a bunch of satellite images before we went and laminate them and bound it and do a little <laughs> into a little book from every different area you know then so the whole time i had it up like okay i think if we go down this channel <laughs> you know <laughs> but it helped it helped a ton oh for sure and it'll probably be way different here this next year after all the flooding on the Missouri the last year and a half. Um, I mean, I, I felt like I knew that place like the back of my hand. I could drive at 4.30 in the morning on a foggy day where I couldn't see 30 yards in front of me, but I could follow my GPS or just knowing where I was to get to my spots on, in the pitch black. But now, this last year, everything changed so much just due to sand buildup in different spots that there was areas I couldn't, I couldn't find a way to get to that you know it's just one of those deals so it'll be all different again the next time you're there i look forward to it for sure year. we'll have so to hunt it next uh, time i come up mm -hmm. yeah you gotta get up here this so, year so another topic uh we're uh super interested to hear from you about is um your photography and for those of you that don't know um he has an awesome instagram filled with wildlife photography so make sure you head over there but <clears throat> Can you go ahead and uh, let us know how you kind of got in to the photography game? Uh, you know, for me, like my interest in photography was, it, it basically paralleled my, my duck hunting interest. Um, I don't know the exact age. I've been asked this a bunch and on a couple different podcasts and on my own I've talked about it. And I was, I was probably like 12 or 13 years old when, um, Canon came out with the uh, it was called the AE1 which was the first camera I think that could do auto exposure and my dad bought one for me basically with a little like 35 to 70 millimeter or 35 to 50 millimeters it was small uh, lens and I had this camera it was a film camera and this was you know, like, probably like 1990 something like that i'm 42 years old you know so i was i was probably 12 13 14 so i mean, i was young and i was i was hoping to get these duck photos i had seen a few in some magazines and you know you just kind of catch a glimpse of what was possible so i thought well man i can do this well of course it was not that easy and a, a friend of ours in the town i'm from owned a photography studio and he let me borrow maybe like a 200 millimeter lens and it was helpful but even then I, the photos I was getting you know back then I would have to send the photos in to be 
Um, you have to send them in to be uh, developed and you get them back a week later and then you were just depressed at what you saw versus what you thought you were going to see. You know, like the duck took up about 2% of the, of the frame on any photo back and so I, it never it never worked as it wanted and that's how I learned how to kind of use a camera have an idea what was going on and then years went by I learned a little bit more about it through some high, a high school class taking some different photos learn the basics um, and then I think man I must have been in my probably 24 25 years old and Canon came out with the first like consumer available digital camera and I thought you know what I'm gonna get this I, I can get these photos so I did what everybody does I bought the cheap, cheapest camera the cheapest zoom lens that you could get and I went to the city park and I started taking photos and photos and of course they didn't look anything like what I saw in the magazines or on the internet back then but I kept shooting and I, I kind of I was into it but I, I didn't put the effort in that was required to get photos that were what I would say awesome so I kind of fell out of it for a few years and then when I moved out here I thought you know what I live in what is the one of the best places to do this I need to get my get off my ass get out of my truck get into the marsh when there's ducks around which is in the spring and start taking photos and learn how to use a camera for real so I bought a different camera uh, bought a little bigger zoom lens and went through the trial and error of <coughs> of uh setting cameras up and doing all this doing all the manual exposure and settings reading as much as i could online which wasn't real in depth back then but there was a little bit and and i still remember to this day the very first time it was a redhead came in and I remember the first time I got a photo and I thought to myself this is just like what David Stimmick takes and it was a redhead kind of all banked all you know feet flaring feet flailed out wings spread looking right at the camera pretty close and it was in focus and I thought oh my god I you know I can do this and from that moment I just kind of just kept doing it and, and playing around and practicing and and for me photography started a thousand percent just as a way to extend my time around ducks like I don't I try to I mean I'm, I'm trying to kind of break out of my uh, my single uh, single known idea of, of being just a uh, duck photographer into doing you know some hunting lifestyle photos and that kind of stuff too which have improved lately but you know I'm thinking mostly known as a duck photographer but that other stuff had I had zero interest in that other other than taking photos of ducks for so many years and, and that's exactly how it started and that was really all I wanted to do because I just I loved being around ducks I loved those images of them and I and that was and still what drives me and it's, if I didn't do that I probably wouldn't have a camera maybe I'd keep one around but and that's that's the main thing that that, that pushed pushed me pushed me to it so long-winded but that's the version no that's a that's an awesome answer and that really helps kind of give perspective on that and um you know it's a definitely uh you got some quality photos and and uh you know you had one you posted just today and pin tiles fl flaring up so i know exactly kind of what you're saying when you're out there extending your duck season and and uh just being out there with them so what kind of tip would you give somebody like what is kind of like the minimum zoom lens you got to have to take those type of photos oh man you know it, it's it's interesting because I, that's probably one of the biggest the questions I get most often asked on my Instagram page. And a little, it depends a little bit on your camera. If you have a crop, a crop sensor camera, probably a 300 millimeter. If you have a crop sensor and if you have a full frame camera, you know, maybe a 300, maybe probably a 400. I, mean, I use a 400. Um, without a doubt, a 600 would be amazing. I don't. I don't have that. I haven't. 
I haven't dropped that money yet. Um, looking to do that maybe on a Sony lens this year. Um, but the the distance that you have to like the the relative closeness that you have to have these ducks to get these photos, like I cannot stress enough how important that is. I mean, even if a guy has a twenty thousand dollar setup on the camera, if you're taking a photo of a pintail single pintail landing at 75 yards with that setup it's not probably going to be very impressive you need to have them at 30 maybe 40 but under 30 yards with most with most average people setups i mean if i if i have a single duck coming in at over 30 yards i'll take the photo but most likely it's probably going to get deleted unless it's something just spectacular just because it's just going to be a, a teeny little duck on a, a big picture and you just when you start to zoom in on it and crop it you just you lose a lot of that quality so unless mm -hmm. it's a flock a photo of a flock of ducks um you know you got to have them really in your face and it's one of those things that you know kind of relates back to what we were talking about before um knowing and, and not underestimating the level of importance of hiding and concealment is huge for that because you know with duck hunting you know if a duck is above the horizon you're not you don't think about that when you shoot it if it's 15 yards above the water well, it's going to get shot regardless but if you're taking a photo of a duck at 15 yards above the horizon or above the water you're just having a blue background photo of a duck and well sometimes that's cool it's it's nothing that's going to really be super usable in terms of print or publishing or any of that kind of stuff you need to get them down super low and that little bit of a difference that last 10 yards is a gigantic difference in terms of the quality of your photos and you know, a gigantic difference in how difficult it is to get them down that low uh, based on how you can hide so you know it all kind of comes full circle the, the two work together i mean you're probably not going to see many guys that are doing a good job of photographing ducks that aren't duck hunters and most good duck hunters probably, if they learned the the uh, photography side, you know, which really, truly isn't that difficult, uh, they'd probably be great wildlife photographers or duck waterfall photographers. That's the hard part. So when you when you photog when you when you photograph them in the spring, are you going? Is it just like a duck hunt? You take your decoys, you call, you call them in, all all the whole nine yards. Um. You know, I, I don't call. Um, it's They're not, in that time of year, they are not really responsive to calls. Anybody who's hunted, like, you know, some of the southern states where they're open in the season late until late, late January, you'll see that those ducks just become less and less, less responsive to calls and decoys. Um, and when you start hitting, when we have open water up here, which is typically give or take the first of march those birds are a hundred percent in mating and courtship mode so you know you could hit a single like you know end of november you hit a single drake mallard with a lonesome hen call and that sucker is probably going to snap his neck to get back to you well this time of year they're just worried and it sounds like they should because that's you know a single hen but they're not worried about coming into that they want to see a hen mallard and they'll go land with that thing but I do set out some decoys. Um, a lot of times it's just to have, you know, some stub substance in the foreground and some decoys in the foreground because then it looks cool. Um, but, like, divers respond amazing to decoys in the spring. Mallards, pintails, and them are pretty ambivalent in terms of how they react to decoys and calls. You know, this past season... The calling thing, I, I had a little bit more trust. I, I brought a call with a few days this year, which I ne have not done for years. We, turn, we turned a couple here and there. Um, but for the most part, you, you need to be in the right spot. You need to be hidden. And you need to just sit there and wait in a spot where ducks don't want to be, for the most part. It's, it's, it's similar but different than hunting, I would say. That, I'm on your website right now, which uh, those of you who are listening, if you want to um, take a look at Phil's 
photos. It's philconkey.com. And, and this picture I've actually seen on Instagram. I think some other people have been posting it around. It's the one where the eagle has the mallard by the head oh, over yeah. the ice. Can you yep. give a background to the story of what all took place on that photo? Yeah. It's funny you picked that one because I uh, I kind of pride myself on make, not taking photos in parks. <laughs> but that is the one photo that I have uh, that was taken in a park or a, like a place where ducks are semi-tame, I guess you would say. Um. It was in late January or February, and I just bought a snowmobile that year, and I went to visit a duck hunting friend of mine that lived in Shakopee, Minnesota, and anybody who lives in that area that's listening will probably know the name of the spot. I can't think of the restaurant, but there's a restaurant that has a big, kind of like warm water, open water pond right behind it, and, and there's thousands of ducks that sit on this thing. And he had to go pick up his kids from our during after our snowmobile trip, from school and so I said oh, I'm gonna grab my camera and just go sit down there for a bit so I went down to this, this spot and kind of buried myself in a snowbank and there had been a uh, a single drake green that it was that was limping around it, it could walk it wasn't doing great but it could walk a little bit and it was hop around on the ice occasionally it would swim and hop on the ice I was sitting on the ice sleeping and all of a sudden from across the uh, the wave, I saw this eagle fly in, and I said, well, I better just put my camera on it just in case, and so I started tracking it with the camera, not really expecting much, not taking any photos, but I had it in focus, and I'm watching it, and not really thinking about it, all of a sudden I noticed that it was flying towards this duck, and this eagle, as I'm watching, all of a sudden it did a like a, a really hard 90 degree turn and I'm like oh hit the shutter button so I started ch -ch 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 clicking away and it was dark I mean it was you know in Minnesota at that time of year it gets dark at 4 30 at night and it was kind of a cloudy day and it was it was probably like 4 20 so it was dark and I'm like well we'll see how these turn out and that eagle did a 90 flew a little bit and I could see it turn its head and drop its feet and it did another hard 90 and it just dove and the next thing I know I'm watching it grab this duck through my camera lens and all I'm thinking is please for the love of God be in focus please be in focus <laughs> because I've never I mean as much time as I've spent out in the outer door I've never ever seen anything like that and then for me to actually have a camera with I'm like God just please work it grabbed it by the head picked it up flew off into the trees and, and I didn't catch it eating it and it landed but uh yeah as I watched it it was super cool I mean it's one of those things that I I never see and I, I expect to see a lot more but it just never happens so it was cool to see um and it's gotten yeah, a ton of, it's gotten a ton of you know every time I post I've posted a few times over the last like three or four years and I think, like, I, Joe Rogan reposted it one time back before he was super gigantic on Instagram, which was cool, even before I knew who he was. Um, yeah, that's, like, probably, like, my most famous photo, but. Yeah, I didn't, I had seen it, but I didn't realize it was yours until I was on the website. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's neat. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's floating around there in several places. You know, it's not, like, it's not my sharpest photo because. You know, I had the shutter speed really low, and I had in the ISO was ISO was pretty high, so it's a little grainy. But that's one of those deals where, like, a friend of mine, Doug Stenke, always says, you know, you don't worry about the focus, you don't worry about the quality, you just get the damn shot. So, yeah. in that in that scenario, it worked. In that scenario, it worked. So, well, one of the thing about it's so cool is it's got with one of its um, feet, it's got the mallard. Um, head and it's dragging it and then the other foot you can see the talons which are so long and it kind of it's just seen the sharp talons on one foot and then with the mallard and with the head and the other it's just it's cool it's a great picture yeah it's it's cool to see like i mean that's what i think like back when rogan posted it like he put something about how savage wildlife is and you see i mean what these birds are i mean they're they're one hell of a killing machine basically what they are when they're not a scavenger i mean 
what what they can take down. He picked it up and, and flew off of it like it was, you know, me picking up a can of pop. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, I think right now is probably a good point to jump to the lightning round. And the lightning round is quick questions, quick answers, and helps us get a better feeling about you and how you duck hunt. So let's jump <laughs> right. right into it. All right. So what's your uh, what shotgun do you shoot? I have about a 2004 Super Black Eagle one with no bluing left on it at this point. <laughs> it's exactly like my dad's. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Same yeah. thing. Tell you what, if you gave me another one, I would take it, but I wouldn't shoot it until this one breaks. <clears throat> it's got awesome. a, uh, it's got a, what's, what's that, uh, high end, uh, the stainless steel spring in the back end. I got one of those and it's reliable and I, I trust it with my life probably at that point. So I, I would have a, high, have a hard time giving it up. Awesome. So this probably goes with, uh, out asking, but what is your dream gun? You know, I don't, it's funny as much as I like to hunt, I'm not really a gun guy. So I would, I don't even, I literally don't even desire another gun. I have other guns. I have turkey guns. I've got a couple other M1s that I've bought here and there, but I got, I'm totally happy with the one, with the one that I got right now. Awesome. Uh, ducks or geese? Oh, that's a no brainer. Ducks. Not, spinner not, or not no spinner? Not even a question. What was the last one? Yeah, I hear you on that. <laughs> yep, yep. Geese are spinner fun. Spinner or no spinner? Oh. <laughs> uh, anybody who's followed me closely or hunted with me, um, zero, zero percent chance of a spinner. I would definitely say no spinner. Yeah, I think it's it's funny. You and I, uh, the first time we talked, we had about a 45-minute conversation. And our hunting styles are like match up perfectly and that's the one area i'm not a huge spinner guy but if i if i don't have one out i just kind of feel naked that was the one thing that uh we parted on a little bit you know it's weird because of the, i remember the first time that i went so i mean when i started hunting there was no spinners and then all of a sudden there were spinners and they were super effective but then what what just got in our heads is and all of a sudden this idea that you can't kill a duck without a spinner. Whereas how many millions of ducks were killed with out spinners before that. <laughs> and so, you know, a buddy of mine, one of my, one of Levi, my best, probably one of my best duck hunting buddies right now, uh, we started hunting together five or six years ago and he didn't use one. And when we started hunting together, I just said, oh, you know what, let's just not use it. And we killed ducks every bit as good as we did with the spinner and we and when they finish they finish nicer and they finish a little bit we always say the word softer because they just come in not so jittery and there was I mean, there's been one time when me and him hunted together where we feel like we got out outdone by some guys with spinners but that's over five years and probably hundreds of hunts but you know it depends but the no spinner thing, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to become more aggressive on a duck call and louder. You're going to have to probably put out a little bit bigger spread sometimes, and you're going to need to be underneath the flight path a little bit more. So, you know, it's just different. I mean, I, I don't care if somebody uses them. I just, I don't like to. It just makes my life easier, and I feel a little bit better about my own duck hunting skills rather than relying on a battery operated device to do it so more power to those who do it and if you don't want to then even cooler i wish i could get to that point uh, i started using them because on public land everyone i just those first years i couldn't shoot anything i was sitting in situations like i should be shooting ducks and everyone around me was just sucking them in with spinners so finally i was like one of the last guys to get one uh, may, maybe maybe I can get to maybe I can get to that point at some at some point in time. <laughs> you know, it depends. It depends too on the spot. I mean, but you know, gosh dang! Like, I mean, Elliot, you've been to that spot where I've been, and you saw the traffic there. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people around, and and I and I can tell. And where we were hunting in 
in uh, Missouri this past year. I mean, we had people literally all around us, and we were the first ones to kill out several times before anybody else shot a duck. And we were not on the X. We just had ducks going over us like everybody else. So, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's a weird deal. I, I would, I'm so, I'm so glad to not use them. I mean, I, I've given a couple of mine away to a buddy of mine who field hunts. And if you field hunt, you definitely need to use them. I mean, there's no way around it. But on the water, on the water, it's, I don't know. I don't want to talk too bad about them. I just, I don't love them. Well, they're a pain. <laughs> there's no doubt they're a pain. <laughs> What's that? They're a pain. Oh yeah, total to use. pain. There's just There's no, noisy, no doubt about that. The batteries, they tip over. You got to turn them this way and that way, and you got to move them. And you know, that's one <laughs> thing that we just don't deal with anymore. Is like that's I love. You don't hear that tick 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 tick, and you yeah. don't hear the. And we never had the question. Oh, maybe we should move the mojos this way. Maybe we should put another <laughs> mojo. Out. Maybe we should take another mojo. Out. Oh, it's cloudy. Maybe we shouldn't put the mojo out. I mean, none of that. Both <laughs> yeah. it's just... We just go out and you just hopefully shoot ducks and if it works, it works and if it doesn't, it doesn't. So. My thought is if you don't have six of them, then it's not worth using them at all. <laughs> that, no, that's kind of the opinion. And, and that's kind of one of the things that really got me really pissed off about them is that, <laughs> is that that was always the answer to if you weren't shooting ducks is, oh, we need more mojos. We need, we need another <laughs> mojo. You know, we don't have enough mojos. And it's always the answer to not shoot. But I can't tell you guys how many times we've had ducks just come and land on their own in our decoys with no calling. And we didn't, we're not even looking. And all of a sudden, here you've got the Drake Mallard hovering over your decoys at 20 yards. It just came in just simply because you have some decoys sitting out there. No mojo spinning and not even any calling, which, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that I don't pride myself on loving to duck call ducks i mean i love it it's my favorite absolute thing about duck hunting but there's a lot of times where we have ducks just come on in you know we're just sitting there eating bacon or fussing <laughs> around with who who knows what we're doing we're not paying attention for a few minutes and next thing you know you look out in the decoy spread and you pop up and oh, there's two mallards swimming in the decoys you know it just happens <laughs> so, yeah yeah that's that's my so, super uh, long maybe... answer to a lightning round question i uh, know <laughs> this happens our this lightning happens. round yeah <laughs> lightning round goes longer than lightning every time, so it's, okay. it's, 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 it's what happens. But so like kind of to add on to that, make extended, it even a little longer. An extended Kansas uh, summer lightning storm round. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So you guys are both on on uh, Instagram a lot, but to add on to that, um, I've seen this sponsored post going around lately, and it's for a twelve duck remote remote duck slotted bag for like 12 mojos <laughs> yeah oh thousand, bucks. <laughs> thousand bucks thousand bucks yeah it's like the epitome of what i would hate yeah <laughs> like, i left some comment salty. on that ad some salty comment i can't remember what my <laughs> remark was but i left some comment i wish i hadn't left after i did <laughs> i haven't seen my it. thought you was know, i haven't seen it probably due to the fact that I, i've tagged a bunch of my photos like no spinners or, no <laughs> mojos or something they probably like stay away from this guy yeah <laughs> It's only nice. going to be vitriol coming from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Next question. What size shot do you use for uh, your duck loads? For ducks? Yep, for okay. ducks. Okay. okay, you kind of put it out there. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've run between two and four shot over the last few years. And for the way I like to hunt ducks... Um, almost anything will work. Um, I tend to shoot some of the cheapest shot available and I like, I like denser patterns. So I think if I were to take my, take my pick, I would take the ounce and a quarter, two shot steel. If I had to buy it, um, you know, there's some of that other shot out now that's amazing. And that stuff makes a hell of a difference. I've shot it on turkeys, uh, but just my standard duck loads are ounce and a quarter, twos to fours. I like a little bit denser pattern rather than extra speed. Awesome. And do you go face paint or no face paint or face mask? Is neither. Uh, neither. I, uh, I don't 
think face paint really matters. I mean, there's probably circumstances where maybe it could. Um, when we're hunting off our boat, we're, we're kind of tucked back into that shadows and I make sure that everybody knows that you need to kind of kick off to the side a little bit and just let an eye poke out. But we're back in that dark part of the blind. Um, you know, if we're hunting something like flooded corn, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to wear face paint. Um, but it, I also feel like in those situations, it's probably it's probably beyond that. They're seeing the big blob that is a dark person sitting back in the corn stalks, or you know, whatever. Uh, but I'm neither. I'm I'm ball cap down, neck gaiter up. I leave my nose exposed and my eyes exposed, just enough to blow a duck off. And do you prefer a layout boat or a, a boat blind? Boat blind, for sure. You're not making bacon in a layout boat, that's for sure. No, <laughs> you're not comfortable. You're not sitting up. Your feet aren't kicked out. It's kind of, and, you know, I feel somewhat funny, like like the way I, I talk about how I like to hunt. I, I kind of talk like I'm all tough than that, but I'm not. I don't. I, I try not to pretend to be. <laughs> I like I like to do things where, like, my duck killing revolves around the skill more so than you know just being in the necessarily being in the right spot or a battery powered deal but man after you put some time into a blind and hiding it and you're comfortable and you can still shoot ducks the same way as you would if you're sitting just you in a spot it's a no-brainer to be in a nice boat blind if it works it's not everywhere but depends on the spot but man yeah i'd I'm all about sitting back and having a good time and staying warm and not having to wear a parka and earmuffs and have the heaters blaring in your face. So Awesome, man. And talking about cooking bacon in a, a boat blind, uh, Elliot's definitely got some stories about burning waiters trying to cook things in his boat blind. <laughs> it's yeah. layout blind. I struggle. Yeah, uh, I, I, I like burning my waiters. like <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty non-forgiving experience right there. <laughs> the worst time was I had a pair of neoprene waders from Rogers, and I ran through like three pair of those in a year, and they kept giving me new ones because, I mean, this, it was the seams that were coming apart, and so they kept returning them because they were just faulty. So the third pair I got, um, we were hunting on the river, and it was really, really cold, so we made a fire, and my knee, of course, you know, neoprene waders get all inflexible and frozen. They're just awful. And I wasn't, this is the first um, hunt I wore these on. I wasn't paying attention and just burnt a huge hole in the leg. Hunt number one. Like, well, I don't think I'm returning these. I don't think they're going to take these back. <laughs> yeah. What happened here? How was it a manufacturing defect? Uh, <laughs> the seams. The bacon fell on my leg. And... <laughs> but I used Gorilla Glue and I just, I mean, this was a huge burn mark. It was probably four inches by four inches. Uh, it was a hole. And, but it, it didn't go through the bottom layer. I don't know what that oh, layer yeah. was. But So I took Gorilla Glue and just caked Gorilla Glue all over it. And I actually got them through almost the whole next season until they started leaking. You know, you can patch neoprenes pretty well. I mean, that Gorilla Glue or uh, Aqua Seal does a ton. I can't hardly get myself to wear neoprenes anymore. But it's a uh, – they're, they're fairly patchable with that Aqua Seal. That stuff is amazing. I mean, you can, like, dang your – hang yourself like grab like your own body weight can hold up on aqua seal so. yeah my problem is when it's the seams i struggle to find oh, where no it is if it's a hole there's i can no i can do but when, once my seams start leaking man I, I i just i've never done like the some people use like baby powder and like a hose um i've never done that <laughs> trick but i don't think you can ever fix it once it's a seam yeah me neither you can't, you can't get that stuff down into the thread you just, and you just you can't penetrate it enough to make it happen mm -hmm. all right so we definitely want to hear some about um what you got going on with banded avery and and uh greenhead gear so you want to go on and, and tell us a little bit about what you got going on over there uh yeah you know it's interesting how i ended up at, at my uh job as it is back in the day when i graduated college in 99 i wanted to work for avery 
outdoors. I mean, they made the best blind bags and the gun cases, and they had everything going. And they were one of the few, the few like manufacturers of waterfall products back then. And so I was, I went and instead ended up at uh, a few different places, and then Cabela's and Avery just. There's not a lot of jobs there. I wasn't about to move to Memphis back then. And um, so years went by and years went by. And I ended up doing some photo work with uh, for Banded as a, a guy from my hometown also works for Banded. We got hooked up at a, uh, at a kind of a waterfowl slash photography event in Louisiana at Honey Break a few years ago and we kind of reconnected then and you know we weren't like super tight friends by any means back then but we knew of each other and then that led to us doing a little more work together and then when Cabela's really merged with Bass Pro I had the opportunity to leave on great terms which provided me some free time to kind of hang around and then when uh, that came up with with uh, banded it switched into what became a full-time a full-time gig and it's been it's been very good and i've kind of loving the opportunities i've had to actually make an impact in you know what is a when you think about a, a waterfall company you think it's one of the bigger waterfall companies but in the big scheme of the world it's a small company and so I've had a chance to do some things that, you know, actually make an impact and, and now going on my first full hunting season um, with them, it'll feel like I'm really had a, a better chance to that. So what, what, what I'd like, what I'm doing is working with our content creators, um, different photographers, different videographers, um, retailers kind of to, to bring, bring things that we can use as a company and other retailers can use to sell our product and it's just been a fun kind of a fun outlet um you know because of course i can use my own photos in this <clears throat> and so of course my own photos can be you know used as a, a hunting situation as well so it's it's a cool deal um you know it's kind of one of those companies combined with avery greenhead that I've wanted to work for forever. Bandit's got a lot of the innovation going on with new products and that type of stuff. And really between, as, as a guy who likes a duck hunt, I can't almost think of anything better because there's almost nothing associated with duck hunting that we don't make besides boats, guns, and ammo. And even then, working with them, you know, we still have some connections to those places. So I can still work with those folks on different things. And it's just been a, a really fun outlet and kind of a place where you, you have some freedom to to do your own thing and make some decisions and all that. And outside of outside of the big-time corporate world that was Cabela's. So everything about it that I really like so far. I never real. I didn't realize. I guess that Banded Avery and Greenade Gear were kind of all under the same umbrella. How long has did they merge at some point, or what, what is exactly the relationship? Is it just a single ownership, but they retain their um, their own names? Uh, you know, I don't know the exact amount of years ago that Avery and Greenhead Gear were per because Avery and Greenhead Gear were one under the ownership of Tom Matthews, and that was, you know, years ago. And then that started, there started to be some troubles there, and and then um, was a, was purchased by Bandit, and uh, I'm just going to say five years ago, I, and it may be more or less, I don't know the exact date. <clears throat> but yeah, they're all under one umbrella now. So with, you know, the Bandit side, you've got the clothing and gear in terms of blind bags and accessories and Avery you've got between Avery and Greenhead gear then you have the decoys and you've got some of the old um, the older school type stuff you know which is you know maybe more near and dear to my heart things that I've had I mean I still have Avery 
an Avery blind bag from probably 1997 that I still use as my kind of carry on when I'm going on a duck hunt somewhere. I'll put all my miscellaneous junk in there. Um, so, you know, there's the two, they're definitely, we're all one company, all one umbrella. Um, there's a little bit of a difference in terms of maybe what people focus on in terms of their work, but we're all one and kind of with the same goal. So it's kind of neat to, to be involved with like every single aspect of duck hunting and have something involved to be able to outfit a person who wants to go duck hunting. Like we take care of all of it. If you if you were to to be a beginner duck hunter and you said, I need this, 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 and this, like we could get you every one of those things as long as it wasn't a gun or ammo. So I dig that. It's certainly extremely impressive equipment. And I know when we talked about uh, the partnership between um, Bandit and Freelance Duck Hunting and then also um, the Duck Gun Podcast, we're certainly extremely excited to begin the partnership. And um, soon we'll be running um, role advertisements. And we're, we're just thrilled and honored to be partnering with you guys because it's just such established um, name in the industry and just, you know, top end gear for sure. Well, you know, it, and, and vice versa, because, you know, like, I mean, guys like you are the ones that we, who are, who we are, like we're hunters, we're, we're guys that are out hunting on our own. We're chasing down spots. We're chasing public land ducks. We're doing all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's, so it, the, the partnership worked out great on that aspect and, and yeah, I mean, and I'm as excited to be with them as you are myself. So, yeah, it's funny I, when we talked the first time. I got I got off the phone. Of the conversation I was talking about. I was like, okay, that guy pretty much is the exact same type of waterfowl hunter that I am. I was like, we hit it off because we see eye to eye, and it's just it's just wonderful to have partnerships with people. It's like, okay, this is this is one of you know waterfowling. You have different types of doing things and. You know, uh, but to be partnered with someone that you see eye to eye with, and it's like, okay, he's he's one of us in in a sense. You know, if that you know what I'm saying. Oh yeah, I I totally agree. I mean, you know, as much as you can be involved with a company or have a big name in the industry, like what what you do and what you project is, you know, what it all comes down to. And I think kind of what we're we're trying to project between myself, you guys, is that you know we're just your average hunter i mean you yeah. know you, you know, maybe you, you you have a chance to do this or do that but for the most part you know we're not i mean i'm not i'm not out duck hunting to go to gather a bunch of photos mm -hmm. okay, i'm out to duck hunt my photos come second i'm not out to go get a bunch of pile picks so i can blab on about how great i am of a duck hunter and none of that baloney and you guys are the same like i that's not it's not what I see in in what you guys are doing so that was one of the main reasons that I reached out to you guys because I, I dig that kind of stuff there's a certain number of waterfowlers it's not every waterfowler that it just pumps through your veins it's like it's it's a part of you you know it's it's not just a hobby it's like it's almost like breathing it's like a, an in-depth desire to, it's like uh, um, primitive almost You're just like i have to go and do this you know oh, yeah. and it's a special thing to have that passion there's not a lot of guys <laughs> it's probably uh, especially annoying to the people around you when that's all you, you talk about <laughs> yeah. in the off season right yeah. well, it's interesting it's interesting because there's a lot of guys that are that are duck hunters that maybe that you might even hunt with it don't quite have that same level of passion and then there's guys that you hunt with that like you can see it in them i mean the the two guys i hunt with the most so my buddy mark and levi and i've got and and bill and there's a few other guys i hunt with that are the same way but the ones i hunt with the most like you see that in them that like they just that's their drive like yes they like to do this and they like to do this also in the off season but like those three to four months are the time period that you absolutely just cannot wait for. I mean, just myself, like I was fishing the other day and man, I was having an awesome day fishing, but all I could really focus on as I was casting shorelines was 
I think I'd get my boat in there. I think if we push the boat, if, I think if we push the boat in there and had this, this kind of a wind, I think it would work. I mean, yeah. and it's not even a joke. I mean, it, it's a hundred percent true. Like, I mean, I I could be catching twenty inch walleyes, and yet I'm still probably more focused on checking the points and checking how well, how deep is it off this point? Can I get my yeah. decoys out there? Yeah, I mean, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's you know that yeah. there's there's a group of guys, and it's funny that we kind of come to this and i have a post that i was writing earlier today for my instagram tomorrow that kind of talks about that like the exact same thing like you know you got a group of buddies that you guys just all get it like you don't even have to talk about it you just know that you all have the same thoughts and feelings about duck hunting amongst yourselves without making a big scene about it and that's just what you do and that's kind of the bond amongst yourselves and those, those are the kind of guys that, man, I just, like, you meet them somewhere and you just know it immediately. You can sense it in them. Like, they don't have to, like, be wearing a certain hat. They don't have to be, you know, have <laughs> photos up about how many kills they got or any of that kind of baloney. You just know those guys once you start talking to them, and I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I was telling, I don't remember who I was saying this to, but it's like when I talk to someone in the boat ramp, I can tell you within 30 seconds whether I'd want to hunt with the guy or not. You just know. Oh, no question. No question. Well, Jordan, I think. Oh, there was one other question I did want to know in the lightning round is what uh, what kind of choke do you use? Um, I really only have one choice on my duck gun because I uh, I um, loctited in a pattern master on my gun like. A few years ago, after losing a couple of them, so I just I just have a pattern master, an old pattern master. At this point, is I don't really have a choice in terms of what I'm going to use. So I like I I personally like as tight as I can get. Um, I have uh, I, I don't know I shoot enough and I've I've shot enough ducks over the years that I feel like I'm a pretty good shot and I I want as tight of a pattern as I can get. So that if the miss, if a miss happens, it's on me. So, yeah, good shooters can do that. Us uh, poor shooters need a little more circle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it just depends. It just, it all depends. It's just a little bit of confidence, maybe is all it is sometimes. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, awesome. Funny. Well, I think this is probably a, a good place to go ahead and wrap her, wrap her up. Um, again, we really appreciate you coming on and um, awesome content, awesome information. Um, and we'll definitely uh, plan to have you on again. Um, a lot of these topics could have been podcasts of, of, the mo- of their own. So, hey, yeah, um, But it. before we let you go, um, go ahead and let people know where they can find you across social media. Uh, my f- main, main outlet that I'm on is uh, Instagram. And that's just Phil Conkey photos. Um, last name is spelled K-A-H-N-K-E. Um, I like to blab on there a bunch and put some photos up. But other than that, I'm on Facebook a little bit. And then I have my own website, just philconkey.com. So I occasionally update that, but not nearly enough as I should. So, yeah, Instagram is where. And I have a podcast if you want to check it out. Um, shooting time podcast hopefully here gonna get i think we have nine episodes out we're gonna get some more out coming up soon once once we can get our act together and go from there so good deal i appreciate it guys awesome all right everybody i'm jordan from duck gun chronicles elliot from freelance duck hunting and conky from bandit avery greenhead gear and photography and we'll see you guys next time See ya.